Hi, everyone. My name is Bobby Saferstein, Director of Programming and Strategy at the Jewish Democratic Council of America, JDCA. And I'd like to welcome you all to Economic Justice Through a Jewish Lens, a community conversation about poverty, inequity, and justice. Today's program will feature panelists Joe Sandberg, Pia Milani, Rabbi Joel Simons, and will be guest moderated by journalist Danielle Barron. Thank you all for joining us. As the only national organization combining Jewish values advocacy with a democratic political agenda, JDCA's series of community conversations bring together today's leading voices to discuss some of the most pressing issues we face. This includes combating anti-Semitism and domestic extremism, stopping voter suppression, gun violence prevention, and today's topic, economic justice. But what does economic justice through a Jewish lens mean? Recently, I had the chance to wrestle with questions at the very center of this issue as part of a Jewish education fellowship at the Hadar Institute in New York. Questions such as, what does it mean to have power? How does tzedakah, charity, and money help, influence, and coerce? Who decides who gets to hold power or is deserving of support? And what are we prepared to do to create a more equitable and just society? Well, for starters, I'll say what most of you probably already know, the answers are not in the texts, they're in the doing. The collective wisdom of our Jewish tradition teaches us that knowledge without action is somewhat meaningless, that the purpose of Torah is to lead us to act. And while the world during which our tradition was conceived may have looked very different than the one we live in now, our Jewish values and guiding principles remain the same. Power is about chesed or kindness and the ability to do for one another. And kol Yisrael arevim zeh bazeh, that we are all responsible for each other. Unfortunately, the gross inequities that we face are also very much the same. Long present and laid ever more bare during the current COVID-19 global pandemic, these include food and housing insecurities, lack of access to an affordable quality education and a good job paying a living wage, and an almost impossible ability to build wealth with each of these disproportionately affecting the poor, minority populations and communities of color, women, and children. As Jewish Democrats, we know it's our responsibility to act, which is why here at JDCA, we remain committed to doing everything we can to address the multifaceted challenges of economic justice. We were proud to support the successful passage of the American Rescue Plan, the first of President Biden's Build Back Better plans designed to end such inequities and are urging the swift passage of the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. Already, President Biden's American Rescue Plan has provided relief to Americans through housing and rental assistance, small business loans, expanding access to affordable health care, and by way of the largest ever tax credit, child tax credit, is well on its way to cutting child poverty in the U.S. by more than half this year. With your help, we can support the Biden administration's efforts to expand these gains and further transform our care economy into one that works for everyone. To learn more about these plans and how you can take action with JDCA, please visit jewishgems.org. And to learn more about economic justice in today's panelists, I'm now delighted to invite, delighted to invite JDCA board member and development committee chair Ada Horwich coming to us from Los Angeles, California to introduce today's first guest. Ada? Thank you, Bobby. Those were very wise and informative words. Thank you so much. Uh, today, I'm really delighted to introduce our first panelist, Joe Sandberg. He's a progressive business leader, an anti-poverty advocate, and co-founder of an organization called Aspiration. Wonderful name. It's the world's leading provider of sustainable services for individuals and companies working to go carbon neutral, one very important uh, topic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Throughout his career, Joe has fought for low income workers and working class families. He was the spark behind California's passage of the earned income tax credit for low income families and founded a massive anti-poverty initiative that has put more than $10 billion back into the pockets of working families throughout California. Joe is an Angelino, a fellow Californian, and we're so proud to have you and to hear more about you. Thank you so much for being with us today. And 
as I said before, it's truly an honor to have him share his opinions and his expertise with us. So Joe, you. with that, I'm gonna ask Bobby to introduce the other panelists and we'll get started. Thank you, Ada. Um, just a reminder that towards the end of today's discussion, we'll open the program back up for audience questions. If you have a question for any of the panelists throughout today's program, please email outreach at jewishdems.org or write it in the Zoom chat and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Pia Milani is a senior economist at the Institute for New Economic Thinking and is the co-founder and director of the Center for Innovation, Growth and Society an organization dedicated to finding new approaches and policies that integrate the innovation economy with broader US markets. Dr. Milani is a seasoned economist and expert in human welfare, previously holding positions at the Harvard Institute for International Development and the Center for International Development at Harvard's Kennedy School. JDCA Next Gen Council leadership member, Rabbi Joel Simons has dedicated his life to advancing core values of Judaism and justice. Recognizing the need for a Jewish justice organization to reach unaffiliated Jews and the wider Jewish community, Rabbi Simons founded the Jewish Center for Justice where he serves as its executive director. Rabbi Simons also serves as the rabbi of the synagogue for the Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles and as associate rabbi for the University Synagogue in Los Angeles. And last but certainly not least is our guest moderator, Danielle Barron. An accomplished journalist, Danielle spent more than a decade covering the American Jewish community for the Los Angeles Jewish Journal, The Forward, and Israel's daily Yiriot Achronot. Danielle has also appeared as a commentator on CNN, MSNBC, and numerous Israeli media outlets. The Los Angeles Press Club named her Journalist of the Year for reporting on sexual harassment and assault a year before the Me Too movement began and she was also recognized as one of the most influential American Jews by the forward. Joe, Pia, Rabbi Simons, and Danielle, thank you all for being here. Over to you, Danielle. Thank you so much, Bobby. First of all, I wanna, first and foremost, I wanna thank JDCA for creating space for this vitally important um, and rare conversation in the Jewish community, and especially to Haley Soifer and the incomparable Ada Horwich, who, when we first talked about doing this a couple of months ago, were incredibly enthusiastic and willing partners. And I also want to thank Bobby Saferstein for his tireless work organizing it, his magnificently beautiful introduction, and Ben Cancer working behind the scenes. And of course, our amazing panelists, who I am so excited to hear from. So let's get started. I want to start with a basic question. And that is, what is economic justice? As, as Bobby highlighted in his introduction, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. And we tend to hear it perhaps more in certain political circles, where it sometimes dovetails with current, let's say our current cultural preoccupation with identity politics. So I want to take a minute to unpack what we mean when we say economic justice, and why is this an issue that everyone should care about? Rabbi Joel, let's start with you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm not sure how I made it on this impressive panel, but um, I will try my hardest to, uh, to do what I can. Um, for us within the Jewish community, um, within the faith community, we really look at economic justice as the opportunity and the movement and the push to ensure that we are living not just in a country, but really in a global society in which all individuals have an opportunity to live in a way um, in which they could have their basic needs provided for, that we can create systems and infrastructure to ensure that regardless of where you were born, regardless of your zip code, regardless of your country code, um, regardless, of, regardless of the status of your family, you really have the opportunity to live a life in which the lack of basic needs will not mean your doom in your future. Joe. Well, I think economic justice isn't actually about opportunity, it's about uh, security and outcome. I think one of the, the reasons that we've fallen so short of fulfilling economic justice over the last 50 years <clears throat> is because we've become obsessed with this idea that we just gotta give everyone opportunity to go as far as their talents may take them. And that is a fundamental breakdown because economic justice isn't about how hard you work or how talented you are or not. Economic justice is because you're a human being. And economic justice, I believe, means that 
as a human being, you can enjoy life's basic needs, which are food, shelter, healthcare, education, and self-determination without regard to how much money you have, to how hard you work, or to how talented you may or may not be. That none of those things, whether you get healthcare, whether you eat, whether you have shelter, have anything to do with whether you deserve or earn or merit. And to put a fine point on it, I think that we have muddied the pursuit of economic justice by allowing the questions of merit and opportunity to infect our understanding of it. Economic justice has nothing to do with merit. Healthcare, housing, shelter, a living wage, these are just things that are about being a human being. And I think that we as Jews have such an important role to play in reminding the world why these are human rights that emanate from the basic fact that we're created by a loving God who wants us to live with authentic human development that requires those elements of economic justice. Betzalem Elohim, in the image of God. Thank you, Joe. Pia, what would you like to add to that? You have to unmute yourself, Pia. There you go. Uh, so thank you, first of all, to JDCA for having me and Danielle for putting this together. Um, I just want to start by saying that my comments here are my own and don't represent the views of INET. Um, and that being said, as a Jew, I do feel very passionately about our notions of tikkun olam and wanting to make the world a better place. And I agree with what the previous uh, two panelists have suggested, that it really is a question of making sure that we meet basic needs of humans so that we can actually go on to achieve um, our best, to our best uh, abilities. You actually, in framing this, Danielle, brought up the issue of identity politics. And this is something that I hope we will get into a little bit deeper because I believe that we've gotten somewhat sidetracked in the conversation in the last maybe seven or eight years where the focus on identity politics, I think, has replaced some of the basic understanding of what it means to be concerned about economic justice issues, to be concerned about people's basic needs. And we've somehow mistaken the idea of defending um, the basic needs of those who have been discriminated against over the years with an understanding that everyone deserves these basic human rights. And we should be striving towards that um, rather than fighting each other and focusing on um, how we need to draw separating lines between different communities and rather all trying to be work, working together so that we achieve these goals for everyone in our society. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you, because there's, there's a lot of food for thought already and we'll definitely have the opportunity to dig deeper into the weeds on some of the things you already mentioned. A lot of people look at the American economy and they see it as a spectacular model of what's possible. The American dream, the ability of an individual to start from anywhere on the economic spectrum and create their own wealth through grit, hard work, entrepreneurship. This is an ideal that has even transcended America and something that people all over the world look to as a model for success. It's also probably the case that for the majority of people attending this event today, if not all of them, uh, America has been good for them. So Joe, who's getting left behind? Who is the American economy not serving? And how has a system that has enabled such unbelievable prosperity to the point where two billionaires are funding their own space programs, also at the same time, economically disadvantaged tens of millions of people who live paycheck to paycheck or worse? It's it, it failed all of us because we're all interconnected. And when so many people are suffering and so many people live on the next edge of crisis and financial ruin, even if the billionaires don't understand it, it's failing them too. Um, the American dream is, is, uh, is a lie for almost everyone. Um, it's probably true that a lot of people on this call uh, have been beneficiaries of the so-called American dream, but um, the reality for most people in the United States is that um, this idea of the American dream is, is propaganda. 
uh, that's used to try and mollify us. It's not borne out in any of the realities that most people live. The reality is we have an economy that rewards um, primarily most those who cheat, that over rewards um, a tiny number of winners, that has fetishized this idea of merit and leaves most people without the ability to care for their family and themselves uh, when they have um, healthcare problems and, and find financial crisis. We have an economy where uh, it's basically um, a political system that's bought by a tiny number of billionaires. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, put a fine point on it. We can't talk about this also without talking about that the American dream is, is especially um, alive for non-white men. Um, I, I absolutely believe that we're all bound together by our common humanity, but we also can't ignore the fact that um, for Black and Brown Americans and for women and for immigrants, primarily the American dream is, is an illusion. Um, you know, every which way you look in the statistics, it's, it's borne out like that. And one could hear this and say, well, Joe, that's, that's pretty negative sounding, but here's what's optimistic about it. All of this didn't come from outer space. Um, none of this has to be. All of this is the result of policy choices that we've made over a long period of time. And what's optimistic about that is that it means if we make different choices and if we agitate and vote and organize and protest, that we can have a very different kind of future where we actually build an economy that lives up to the American dream. I mean, MLK said, it, I think, well and germane to this point, and I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase, but he basically said, we're only asking America to live up to what she said she is. But, you know, America falls way short of what she says she's supposed to be. So I saw both uh, Pia and Rabbi Joel nodding their heads um, while you were speaking. I want to actually um, talk, bring up some statistics that have come to the fore even in the past year during the pandemic. Um, as many of you know, yes, we are still in the midst of a global phenomenon called the pandemic. And one of the incredible things that's happened in this past year is that it's really on this, this pandemic has unearthed so many issues in our society that for various reasons, we were suddenly able to see, really see, maybe for the first time. And one thing we saw was an incredible divide between the experience of those with assets and the, or the kinds of jobs that could easily be managed from home um, and the experiences of those we came to call essential workers who didn't have the luxury of working from home and were delivering food and goods and services, administering medical care, stocking Amazon warehouses, et cetera, uh, to say nothing of the millions of people who lost their jobs completely. Um, Scott Galloway, a professor at NYU Stern School of Business and a prominent public speaker and podcast host, has talked about the many ways in which the pandemic here not only highlighted um, some of the profound inequalities that exist in our country, but exacerbated them. He has what I would call a Dickensian view of this period, calling it the best of times, the worst of times, because while the two largest asset classes in America, real estate and the stock market, reached record highs, 80% of those assets, by the way, are owned by the top 10%. At the same time, one in five households was reporting some form of food insecurity. A third of Americans were worried about making rent. Uh, Jeff Bezos reportedly lost $38 billion in his divorce and made it back in one month during the pandemic. Galloway's also referred to the federal response as the quote, great grift, claiming that it helped the wealthy accrue trillions of dollars while throwing quote, a few loaves of bread to the suffering. I wanna to turn to our resident Harvard educated economist, Pia, and ask, uh, do you agree with Galloway's assessments? Are these exaggerations? Um, and if not, how did we get here? Thanks, Danielle. Um, I don't think they're exaggerations. So I do believe that the um, pandemic, more than anything, has really sped up what we were seeing happening before. And it sped it up so rapidly that we 
understood at a completely different level what the trends were. But even before that, we were seeing the top 1%, 0.1% of income earners in this country owning as much wealth as the bottom 90% combined. If you look at the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality in a country, it's gotten so much worse over the last 20 years. It's um, gotten almost a quarter. Um, it was at point uh, four, I believe it's almost at point five now with one being complete inequality and zero being um, complete equality. So our Gini coefficient has been declining substantially. And the results of that actually very interestingly, I think tie in with some of the political issues that we're facing. So one of the things that we've been finding is that polarization has been increasing in this country at a very rapid rate. If you look at something called the DW nominate scores, which look at the voting um, records of uh, Democrats and Republicans, you start seeing a huge increase starting about five or six years ago. And in 2015, we actually saw an, a statistic that was shocking to many of us, which is that for the first time ever, life expectancy in a developing country actually declined. And this is something that economists have termed deaths of despair. And it mostly affected low-income workers, those with low education, um, very much uh, hit the manufacturing sector, Rust Belt America. And if you think of the politics in 2016 and what was actually behind those elections, you found that um, this was feeding very strongly into the polarization we saw. In fact, if you look at the votes uh, Mitt Romney got versus the votes that Donald Trump got, just on the Republican side to look at polarization effects, you found that those that suffered the worst in terms of these deaths of despair, which were really coming out of suicide and alcohol uh, abuse, um, it was those who suffered the most from those effects that were choosing to vote um, for Donald Trump and a more radical populist um, politics. So I do think that there is a lot to be said for this idea that income inequality is underlying much of the issues around polarization, the political problems, and many of the other problems that we're seeing in the country today. Thank you, Pia. Um, I want to invite um, Joe or Rabbi Joel to, to add to that, because I know this is a big issue, just talking about some of the root causes of inequality. And, and the question, Pia, thank you for bringing up that index report, because one of the questions I had personally is like, how bad is it really? How bad is um, inequality and poverty in America? And what are the consequences for a society, for all of us that in a, in a society that has high rates of inequality? Well, Danielle, if I can take that, I want to um, differentiate between the consequences of our poverty crisis and the consequences of our inequality crisis. They're both terrible, but they're different. The consequences of our poverty crisis is obviously, as we know, eight out of 10 Americans live paycheck to paycheck, and so many Americans earn subsistent wages, don't have health care, have um, food insecurity, and so much more. But we could end poverty and still have the consequences of inequality, which is about the threat to our democracy. The problem with inequality and the proliferation of multi-billionaires that have the wealth of nation states is that their concentration of power over a democracy that in the present construct allows for money to be equivalent to speech means that they control our democracy. And so I, I would put this very clearly, either we change the political rules so that money no longer equals speech, or we have to have a wealth tax. If we don't do one of those two things, the strength of our democracy's pillars will continue to deteriorate to a, a point where th there will be no democracy. I don't know if it's in 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, but if you look at the continuation of these charts, we cannot have a democracy that coexists with the type of power that's concentrated in the hands of a couple hundred people who are allowed to buy democratic outcomes. That definitionally no longer becomes a democracy. But that Thank is you. a little bit different, pernicious but different than the problems of the poverty crisis. Yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit more about poverty a little bit later, um, but I wanna actually, I wanna open it up under a, a Jewish lens for a moment, if you will, and sort of bring in a Jewish perspective to this conversation. So uh, Rabbi Joel, um, 
as many of us know, economic fairness is something Jewish tradition takes very seriously. There are scores of Talmud tractates that dictate Jewish business ethics, the laws of tzaka, the rules for tithing, for giving debts in a sabbatical year. Isaiah says you should share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. And of course, we know on Pesach, we say all who are hungry, come and eat, and so on. So while Judaism is certainly amenable to the acquisition of wealth, the tradition is also very clear that those with resources bear responsibility for ensuring the welfare of those without. I've even go so far as to suggest that Judaism has a kind of inbuilt social welfare philosophy. Um, what do you think is the most persuasive argument Jewish tradition makes for why we should take care of the poor? And maybe you wanna share a specific Jewish text or idea that has inspired your work in this area. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. I think, um, you know, you can open up most any book within, um, within the canon of the Jewish library um, and you could really see that, that, that mandate um, for us to not just care for ourselves and not just care for our neighbor, to really to care for the entire community. Um, I think the problem within the Jewish tradition, both in years past and in today, is that we do a really good job of quoting text and we do a really bad job of living by those texts. Um, and you know, we, it, it is easy for us to come to synagogue and to sing those songs. And it is really easy for us to focus on the pageantry of the holidays. And it is really hard for us to internalize what those texts are asking us to do. And those texts are asking us to do something that's really hard and that is fundamental radical change. Um, we are weeks away from the high holy days. Don't mean to stress anybody out with that. Um, and the high holy days are not just, okay, here we are and you know we're gonna tinker at the margins of our life and of society. The high holy days ask us for radical change. They say every single year we have an opportunity to change radically, to change the way that we act, to change the way that we act as a society. And every year we tinker at the margins every so ever so slightly. And I think that is one of the greatest sins um, and I'm okay with talking about sin, especially as we are just a few weeks away. Um, it's one of the sins of our time, and it's one of the sins of the time before us, that we take one day and we deny ourselves food, and we live one day what it's like, just a fraction to experience that kind of pain. And what do we do at the very end of that day? We stuff our faces, we smile with friends, and we wake up the next morning and we go on as business as usual. And if we continue that, though it won't be business as usual. It will be a time that we don't know. And so I think for me, one of the greatest things that we have to do is we have to stop quoting text and we have to stop and we have to start living by that text. And we have to start talking about one simple word and that's compassion. Because at the end of the day, what this is about is compassion, right? It, it's, 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 can we hear these numbers? Tens of millions. Can we see these images of, of children starving? Can you see the, the, the pain on parents' faces when they can't provide for their children? And if we can't respond with compassion, then we're lost. I mean, if it doesn't break you, that's what the high holidays are meant to do. That's what these texts in Judaism are meant to do. They're meant to break us. They're meant to break us open so that we can then respond accordingly. And the problem is, how do we respond? Well, we don't respond as Jews sometimes. We respond as this, these, these tribal members of a society and say, oh, is this really my responsibility? Oh, well, what if government does this? This is the slippery slope. We're not responding with, what if government solves the greatest sin of our time? What if government prevents this kind of despair? And I think that's where we need to start. I'm, I'm sorry for preaching. I'm just getting ready for a few weeks from now. Oh, preach on. Pre feel, preach on, I'm, preach I'm so inspired by what you said. And, you know, it makes me ask this question, which I grant will sound provocative, which is, as Jews, are we doing what we're supposed to do for America and all the people who live here in poverty? And the answer is, hell no. You know, we ask so much about what America can do for us. And, you know, not to be cliche, but it really makes me think of what JFK said. What about what we need to do for America? We've always been the people at the tip of the spear of justice. We've always been, for the history of Judaism, supposed to be the people that speaks for and advocates for the outcasts. Well, how are we doing 
on that front. When we look around the United States and we see the amount of suffering that exists, I would say we're doing a pretty bad job and we should be ashamed of ourselves. I'm ashamed of our community's failure to do more on economic justice in this country. And I'm especially ashamed of it when I think about the potential for what we could do if we took serious our historic responsibility to be the tip of God's spear for justice and to stand for those who are outcasts, we would end poverty in the United States. And things aren't getting better, things are getting worse. And this pandemic better be a clarifying point for us as Jews to understand God's expectations of us. Thank you, Joe. Pia, I, I, wanna, I wanna take it back a step to you for a moment to talk about some of the root causes. We're, we're talking a lot about, yes, there, there are a lot of problems. We know we have a lot of problems. We know we have a lot of fixing to do. But I wanna talk for a moment, if you will, about how we got here and what are some of the root causes of the inequality and poverty that we're seeing specifically in, in this country, in America. Sure, let me just touch on a few things. First of all, I liked Joe's distinction of poverty versus inequality. I do believe the answer to the poverty question is as a society creating safety nets. It's great that we can all work at our local food bank and contribute to a homeless shelter, but we do need a response at a national level and we need to put in safety nets. And you know, Northern Europe was able to do it. If we are just serious enough about creating a system of taxation so that the government is well-funded enough, we can make sure that we don't have the kind of poverty issues that we are dealing with currently. The second issue is the inequality issue, which again, I think is critically important. And I believe, you know, just to go back to once again, what Joe was saying, the issue of money speaking in politics, there is an entire area of research um, done by Tom Ferguson and others called the investment theory of party competition, where they find that if you look at congressional elections, at some point, we started seeing almost a one-to-one -one correspondence in those who put in the most money and those who won elections. So really, we're at the point where it re really isn't one man, one vote anymore. It's much more one dollar, one vote. So to the extent that we want to make deep changes in our economy, we need to make deep changes in our politics, and campaign finance is going to be one of the critical pieces of that. In terms of what we've been doing over the last 20 years, if you look at what happened with how hard we sold this notion of globalization, it's very important that we think of us, I, I think of the world as a whole, and we think of everyone as being important. But I do also believe that we need to look in our own backyard first. And if you look at how things like NAFTA were pushed, we understood very well when NAFTA was going through that it was going to have distributional considerations. And sure enough, when we had China let into the WTO, when we had the passage of NAFTA, we started seeing manufacturing in this country become decimated. And if you look at what's happening politically, how much of that goes directly back to Rust Belt America and what's happened with our manufacturing sector. So we really need to think about what we were doing when we were adopting these neoliberal policies around globalization and start rethinking at a fundamental level what we want to do structurally with our economy. And Thank yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I mean, this is this is wonderful, but I, I want to actually represent um, an argument that I hear sometimes, especially in, in, in the Jewish community. Um, one thing one thing I sometimes hear people say in our community is like, well, my grandparents came here with nothing and they made their way and they're very successful. Why can't people help themselves? Why can't people fend for themselves? And here you are making an argument about how influential and instrumental policy is. So how do you how do you respond to that argument that you know people pe their grandparents pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and therefore everybody should be able to. Yeah, you know the Jewish community is exceptional, but I will say that an advantage that we have had from time immemorial is the focus on education and the access to education. So as limited as our opportunity set has been in various situations, we've always had access to um, the striving for learning and the ability to focus on that that many other communities in this country haven't had. So I, I think it's, it is the immigrant experience and it's not just Jews, you see it amongst Asian Americans too, right? The immigrant experience does speak to a particular um, set of values, but I also believe that we have the ability as a nation 
to make sure that others have access, that everyone has access to the ability to be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps mm -hmm. after they've had access to things like basic health, basic nutrition, housing, and education. Thank you. I want to give um, Joe or, or Rabbi Joel an opportunity to, to add it if you'd like. Well, I would say in response to um, a person who says that, that um, first of all, um, lots of respect for the turmoil that you faced or your grandparents faced. But um, as a Jew, you should understand that we don't do anything by ourselves. There's no such thing as you pull yourself up by your bootstrap. And if you think that's a thing, you should spend a little bit more time with Torah. That's not a thing. We do it through um, our own work, but we also do it through our relationship to our community and to our nation. And I think um, building on this point about globalization and where we became disconnected from our own uh, scriptural tradition, all throughout um, our uh, scripture and wisdom books, it says you take care of your family first, you take care of your community, then you take care of the world. Because obviously, if everyone takes care of their family, you get the, the logic. And um, I think it's absolutely okay for us as a nation to prioritize through our public policy our own, uh, our own residents. And in NAFTA and in globalization, we sold short Americans. And um, the politicians who made those decisions, uh, we can give them the benefit of the doubt or not. But the track record is really clear. Uh, Americans are far worse off than they would have been if we didn't have um, globalization. The final uh, point I would offer with a smile uh, to that person is I would say, during that time period when um, your family member um, so supposedly raised her himself up by their bootstraps, let's look at the public policies that were in place. We had a much stronger social safety net. We had a much higher tax system. We had a much more functional government that was funded by that higher tax system. And so maybe it was more possible uh, if you were um, working at that time, but at this time, when we've taken apart government, when government no longer can serve even the most basic functions of distributing masks and vaccines to people, to say that uh, it's as simple as uh, rising up uh, through the work of your own lifting of bootstraps is, is really farcical. Well, Joe, thank you for that. And also, I just want to add that we will we'll take all your points with a smile. They're 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 better that way. Um, Thanks. One of the things that Rabbi Joel and I discussed earlier in the week is the stigma and shame around Jewish poverty. There is this perception that Jews are all wealthy. <laughs> that and of course that's not true. Um, while the Jewish community is certainly well resourced, that doesn't mean Jewish poverty doesn't exist. It does. Uh, the Torah itself says the poor will never cease to be in the land. So I'm wondering, and I, I'd like for each of you to respond to this, do you believe that? Is it possible to completely alleviate poverty? Because the Torah is telling us the poor will always be around. And that's why we have such an elaborate um, set of uh, dictates on how we should, we should engage and, and deal with the poor among us. Um, so I wanna know, so Rabbi Joel, let's start with you. I mean, is it, is it possible to, to live in a world with, with no poverty? Listen, I think, the Torah wants, I think the Torah wants us to prove it wrong. I think God would happily smile if we ever became close to that moment in time and God would say, thank you, let's write a new chapter. Um, I think that has to be our bar. Right, that has to be our our mission. Um, we have to be able to do that. Um, other otherwise, what are we doing? Right, you know, we're, we're we're not supposed to just do a little bit and and pat ourselves on the back and say, okay, wonderful, good job. Now the next generation. Um, we're supposed to hand off um, our work to the next generation, knowing that we did all we can do and then a little bit more. So on some level, though, you could also argue that poverty is relative. So what we think of as poor today would have been unfathomably rich in medieval times. And what's poor in America is not necessarily the same as what's poor in Myanmar or in India. So P and Joe, I would love your perspective on how should we shape our expectations around the reduction or the ending of poverty? Pia, why don't you go first? So um, as you know, I grew up in India. My mother was part of the very small Calcutta Jewish community and was very, very poor. She lost her father when she was 12. Her mother didn't really have an education. 
but she always knew she could rely on the Jewish community. So there was a Jewish community girls school, they had a Jewish hostel, they had the ability to access food. The fact that there was a community that was strong enough to support her means that she never knew the kinds of poverty that many other people in India experience. And I think this is the key, you know, Joe brought up earlier the issue of community to the extent that we can all function as a community that is there to make sure that we take care of others. We may never get to the reduction of absolute poverty, but as you point out, there's an issue of relative poverty and we can make sure that we can actually meet people's basic needs. Joe, do you wanna to add to that? Yes, first, <laughs> I, thought so. I don't think that, uh, I don't think that that, it, that that language means that poverty defined as economics would always be among us. Um, I believe that it meant that uh, poverty defined as spiritual poverty would always be among us. Um, and as an attachment to that, ending poverty is one of the most possible um, objectives among the terrible injustices that surround us that we could, that we could achieve. We just want to be really clear about it. It's super easy to end poverty. There are a lot of terrible things in the world that are really hard to solve cancer, so many diseases, we, we don't know how to cure them. How we end racism, I don't know yet. How we end misogyny, I don't know. How we end anti-Semitism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, I don't know. We can end poverty tomorrow. Poverty is because we don't distribute money properly. We have a world of abundance and we could tomorrow, if we wanted, ensure that every single human being on the earth was not of want for food, healthcare, housing, education, period. So if, if you remember only one thing I say today, I hope it'll be that don't let anyone tell you that we have to settle for anything less than absolutely ending poverty. That is a lie that we've been told for a long time. We have more than enough resources to end poverty. We know exactly how to end poverty. And of all the terrible things that exist in the world, ending poverty is probably the easiest thing that we can do immediately, which also means our failure to do so makes it the most morally odious failure of failures that I can imagine. Because the only reason we haven't ended poverty is that we have chosen not to. And we are all complicit in that in a democratic society where we have voted for politicians and failed to hold them accountable in a system that has failed to distribute resources necessarily to end poverty, but we can end it tomorrow. Thank you, Joe. Um, before we move to the Q&A, if Bobby will allow me, um, I want to look to the future for just a moment and talk about some reasons for hope. Um, there's a growing movement in this country that believes capitalism is to blame for many of our society's ills and who might point to a system like, say, socialism and say that's a more economically just system, philosophically speaking. Is it possible to have a fair, conscientious capitalism? And what would that look like? Pia? Absolutely. I think it means we need to actually understand what some of the limitations are and we need to understand we need regulations. Um, my favorite expression is we need fettered capitalism. Um, I hear Silicon Valley um, techno utopians often talk about unfettered capitalism. And I think this is really something that we need to understand the seeds of the destruction of capitalism are built into the system, but we know what they are. And to the extent that we understand the theory, we know exactly how to address it and what we need to control. So for example, we're finally starting to see some pushback on economic consolidation in terms of antitrust. The Biden administration has really taken this on as an issue. And to the extent that we have billionaires able to fly, to fly into outer space at, at while people are starving, once we actually start addressing these issues, we know how to do it and we know how to make capitalism actually work for us. And really it's the only system that can work for us because to be honest, it has gotten more people out of poverty than any other system could ever have hoped to, but we need to know how to regulate it. Um, I'm also wondering um, if we can look, who's getting economic justice right? Is there a country or a system that we could look to as a model for a better way? I, I, I throw that out to all of you, whoever feels like they wanna respond. Well, can I um, respond on the point of, of capitalism? Sure. The United States isn't a capitalist society. It's a corporatist oligarchy. And that's an important distinction. 
what people are saying that they um, despise in the United States economy right now, and, and rightfully so, are features of oligarchy and corporatism. Uh, none less than Adam Smith, who no one would describe as, as anything but a free market capitalist, said that monopolies and capitalism can't coexist. Another tenet that's crucial for the existence of capitalism is clear rule of law, equal application of rule of law, no one's above the law. And presently our economy is dominated by monopolies that you abuse and abuse their market power and is not an economy where there's equal application of the law. In fact, what usually happens more often than not, too often, is that companies um, break the law for a long enough period, effectively enough to accumulate enough market power so that by the time un understaffed regul regulators are able to find them and punish them, they have so much market power and so much money that they laugh at the small fines that are imposed on them. That's the economy we're living in right now. Whether or not capitalism is the best system is a different question than understanding. We actually don't live in a capitalist system right now. We live in a corporatist oligarchy. Um, Rabbi Joel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to you with one, one last question before we go to the Q&A. Um, and that is, um, you know, I'm interested also in the kinds of policies that might set us on a corrective course and what are the priorities of the things that we should be addressing in order to have that more conscientious um, capitalism. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the the policies and, and things you're pursuing at the Jewish Center for Justice and the things you see as really kind of core priorities for our community to support. Absolutely. Um, I think there's about a thousand different policies and priorities at the state, um, at, at, at the local state and the, the national level. And we have to advocate for all of them. And we have to look at, at, at this as a whole, not just as one lane, you know, not just as, yay, you know, we passed this one plan, we're good to go. Um, the moment we pass one plan, we then have to pass another plan. We have to look at everything that we do at every level as adding to this. One of the things that we have been advocating for here in California for the longest time has been has been paid sick leave and paid family leave. When you look at the data, when you look at the statistics, when you look at the people who benefit most from this, especially at this moment in time, in this moment in the pandemic, to pay, to, to allow people to take time off because they are not feeling well or they have to they have to you know assist a loved one a family member um we have to be able to advocate for those kinds of policies. We have to advocate for housing policies. I think one of the things, and, and I'll, I'll just wrap up in, in, in 30 seconds, uh, for those, for so many of us on the panel that are here in Los Angeles, I think one of the things that surprised so many of us back in December and January when COVID was so, um, was so rampant out here was that we didn't really understand our city. We didn't yeah. understand how dense Los Angeles was because we all live in our bubbles. And so I think we have to understand where we live. We have to look beyond our neighborhoods. We have to look beyond the 10 miles to the 20 miles and solve healthcare and paid sick leave and housing and so much more. And I think it's a case in point that, you know, part of the reason we didn't really know our city is because our community tends to congregate on the west side where um, real estate values are higher and you have more space and you're not living with your, you know, six or seven other family members um, in a two bedroom apartment. Um, okay, Bobby, throwing it to you. <laughs> thank you, Danielle, and thank you to everybody. Um, I just want to remind everybody that during the audience Q&A, which is now, uh, if you have a question, please post it in the chat. We'll do our best to get to all of them. So this first question is for everybody, but maybe we'll start with Pia. Uh, it's from Martin S. Labor rights are clearly a huge portion of pursuing uh, just economic justice and economic equality. Can you give us a snapshot into what's happening on that front, including with the PRO Act and why the Jewish community should support labor rights? Martin, thank you for that question. I couldn't agree with you more. I think a huge piece of the inequality issue is what's been happening to labor. We've seen a destruction of labor unions over the last 50 years, and the leverage and bargaining power of labor has declined to such an extent that I think it's fed into many of these other issues. Um, I believe that one of the issues around antitrust that we're seeing is again a pushback on monopsonies. So to the extent that you have a monopolist, they control um, the market for products, but they also control the market for labor. If you have one employer, you have what we call a monopsony. 
And because there has been such consolidation, especially in big tech, you're seeing incredible power concentrated in the hands of Amazon, Google, um, these giant companies and labor has very little control. And once again, the money issue comes into play. So to the extent that Amazon workers actually did try to unionize, we saw how much of this huge money was put into making sure that that didn't happen. Um, once again, I think breaking up monopolies is gonna go a long ways towards helping us with this issue. I believe that we need to figure out how to um, strengthen unions. And there is this term that we hear batted about a whole lot nowadays, which is shareholder versus stakeholder capitalism. How do we make sure that stakeholders actually have a voice in companies and corporations so that labor has some voice so that we can actually make sure that going forward, especially as we start seeing automation really change what our work looks like in the future, that workers have some leverage and some bargaining power and some control in this marketplace. Joe, would you like to jump in? Yeah, Pia made a really important point on, on monopsony. And I want to use that to um, applaud the Biden administration for a really meaningful act they've taken to loosen the grips that employers have over workers around non-competes. One of the crucial steps the Biden administration has taken that I don't think has been um, well enough applauded is they're weakening the ability to hold workers under non-competes. And I want to take a moment to educate everyone on what these non-competes mean. You might have heard of these around tech employees and thinking, well, you know, Google makes you sign them so you can't go work at Apple or I'm just picking a random example. But that's a different question. What's pernicious, what's unfolded and what the Biden administration, I think, is going to effectively stymie is the use of non-competes to prevent low-wage workers from going from Burger King to McDonald's. Literally in parts of the country, Burger King would make a worker sign a non-compete that would prohibit them from going to McDonald's to work there. And so think about the effect that has on wages for long-time workers when your local McDonald's can't compete for your labor with a higher wage than what the local Burger King is presently paying you. That is, that is basically, that is wage collusion. And it's been a total bastardization of the idea of a non-compete that, you know, it, the, the merit of non-competes for high paying um, service sector jobs aside, I don't think any fair-minded person on any part of the ideological spectrum ever thought that there should be non-competes that restrict um, the ability of a low-income worker to take her or his labor to different fast food restaurants, but that's literally what's happened. Um, and so, um, you know, I just thought it was an interesting opportunity to come in and, and, and applaud the Biden administration for something really insightful that they've been doing to stop this bastardization of non-competes. And Rabbi Simons, I mean, what of our tradition when it comes to Judaism and why the Jewish community should be supportive of labor rights, what, is, what does our tradition have to say on this? I mean, you know, there's there's the American Jewish tradition um, in which we were at the forefront of the labor movement, um, you know, at the turn of the century. Um, but I think at the end of the day, when you parse through all of our texts, it's very clear on supporting the worker and support and you know giving them a fair wage, giving them the opportunity, ensuring that they are not taken advantage of. Um, and but you know, aside from just a specific text. It's the tenet of our faith to act in a way of compassion and kindheartedness and fairness. And it's not about one versus the other, but it's about a fairness for all. Thank you. So our next question, uh, it's a natural segue into uh, our next question for all of you as well. It's from Francesco. Democrats are currently working to pass some of the largest investments in equity policies in our economy in history through Biden's Build Back Better plan. However, Republicans are fighting against these plans with claims of inflation. How true are these claims? And how can we combat this and emphasize the importance of these economic justice policies that require investments in our economy? Maybe I'll start with Joe. Inflation's uh, all fine when it's uh, of assets that rich people own, but you get one little whiff of wages rising and everyone's in panic. Yeah, you know what? We need wage inf inflation. Problem we've had for 40 years is we've had no wage inflation. 
and this uh, you know anti-inflation obsession of uh, the conservative and, and frankly center-ish left part of the political spectrum has really been um, a neoliberalism uh, wrapped around trying to suppress uh, wages to maximize profit margins. And it's one of the many reasons that so many people have been left working three jobs and still unable to afford life's basic needs. Uh, we need some wage inflation. It's about 40 years overdue. Thank you. And, and Pia, if you have anything to say to that. Sure. Um, so after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, when we went into a really deep um, recession, I remember hearing these concerns about inflation. You know, as we started pumping money into the economy, it was not nearly enough. Everyone now looks back at that time and says we clearly didn't put enough money in. But there were exactly these fears around inflation. I've heard Larry Summers, I've heard many other people with similar concerns now. We are seeing inflation rising to some extent at this point, but it's very clear that what we're seeing right now is because we had um, bottlenecks in certain sectors because of the pandemic. And I really don't see any indication that we're gonna have um, serious inflation as a result of the money that we're pumping in now. There are issues around the debt, there are issues around the deficit, but I do believe that unless we actually build an infrastructure that's strong enough, we're not gonna be able to get the kind of growth we need to be able to deal with this on a longer term basis. So maybe the short term inflationary pressures, but I believe that long term, we need this in order to encourage the growth to be able to pull our economy out of where we've been. Thank you. And I have one final question uh, for, from Shana from Arizona. From the previous administration's corporate tax cuts to President Biden and Secretary Yellen's efforts to create a global minimum corporate tax rate, corporate taxes have become a large part of the public discourse on economic policy. Can you give us a quick lowdown of why this matters, what President Biden is pursuing, and why a fair corporate tax code is critical for economic justice? Uh, we'll start with Pia. Well, the corporate tax rate now is considerably lower than um, the income tax rate. And we know that um, the 1% that we were just talking about earlier gets most of their wealth through, um, gets most of their income through capital, not through labor. So to the extent that we actually want to be shifting the tax burden onto those who should be paying more of it and who can most afford to pay it, it's gonna come down to the corporate tax rate. And the interesting thing is that before this, anytime anyone wanted to raise the corporate tax rate, we'd simply hear that, well, you're gonna have capital flight and um, corporations are gonna move to other countries that are more welcoming. This is why it's been so helpful to actually see a global move to set a global minimum on corporate tax rates so that we will hear less, hopefully, about this issue of global uh, capital flight and we'll actually be able to raise these rates. Now they're talking about a 15% global minimum, which unfortunately is going to end up becoming 15%. So I really don't think it's nearly enough. But I think this is where we need to be focusing our attention. We need to be raising the global corporate tax rate so that we don't have to worry about issues like capital flight and we can make sure that we can actually raise taxes in this country on those we need to be raising taxes on. Thank you. And Joe, do you have a comment on the corporate tax rate? Well, I, I definitely agree it needs to go up. But I'd also note that the most effective tool that will inevitably start to utilize, even though it's not yet um, broadly discussed, is a wealth tax. We're not going to address extreme wealth inequality without a wealth tax. It's, it's not actually possible because you can tax income uh, to infinity, but if you have a system that only taxes assets when they're traded, sold, right? all you end up with is exactly what we have, which is a country where a small number of people have hoarded their assets, never sell their assets, just borrow against their assets to finance their lifestyle and accumulate billions and hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth. There's only one economic answer to that. It's a wealth tax. We already have a wealth tax called a property tax. So when you start to hear this and people push back to, oh, you know, you can't have a wealth tax. That's baloney. We tax property. Everyone who owns a home knows about the property tax. And for the same reasons that we can tax property, we can tax other assets. And in fact, 
taxing other assets through a wealth tax will ultimately be the way that we address wealth inequality. And it's the only actual functional way. Everything else is nibbling around the edges. Thank you. Um, I think for our very last question, I'm gonna pass the baton back to Danielle. Danielle. Thank you, Bobby. First of all, I just wanna say like, amen, amen, amen. So, so many things I heard today. So thank you to our amazing panelists, really. Um, I wanna ask one final question. And I'm going to ask you to do the Reader's Digest version of your answer because we are a few minutes over and I know um, everyone wants to get going and we still want to hear from the lovely um, Haley. Um, it's impossible to talk about economics without talking about power. And I want to conclude this conversation by addressing the topic of Jewish power. Um, in our tradition, I think there's a real tension between power and powerlessness, and there's an ambivalence about Jewish power. Um, Brett Stevens, um, the New York Times columnist who is now editing a Jewish journal called Sapir, which is quite wonderful, and I recommend it to everyone um, still here. Um, he recently wrote, for Jews, power has always been a difficult idea. Judaism is perhaps the first and arguably the finest sustained attempt to subordinate power to morality, to insist that right makes might rather than the other way around. From the time of the prophets, Jews have made the critique of power a canonical aspect of our tradition. So because I think the Jewish community does have a great deal of wealth that gets deployed to various causes. Um, I wanna talk about individual responsibility and I wanna talk about Jewish responsibility with power. Um, from a Jewish point of view, is it good to become very wealthy because then you can give Sadaka, or is becoming a billionaire inherently wrong? And if you're Jewish and wealthy, how much should you give to Jewish charities and how much to general charities. So I'm gonna leave it to, um, I'll, let's take each one minute to answer that question or less if you can. And uh, Rabbi Joel, let's start with you. Um, amazing question and, and, and build up to this. I think at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is how are we gonna build this coalition of conscience? How are we gonna expand this group of, of individuals and organizations that are going to move us forward? And for me, it's less about which charities you give to, but it is about how you are moving the ball forward to eradicate this problem. And to the opponents of this, to the ones who are seeking wealth and power and not helping, we need to hold them accountable and put them on record. And we need to stop hiding behind complex issues and say right versus wrong, moral versus immoral. What are you going to do with the power that you have and how are you going to make things better? Not tinker at the margins, but radical change. Yeah. I absolutely agree with the idea of radical change. We've uh, probably all seen Anand Giridharas' work about um, philanthropy. And what the issues are around philanthropy, I think it's really important that we create structures that function at a more universal level so that we're not dependent on individual philanthropy. But I do believe that we need to all be guided by our moral compass. And uh, Joe, give us, our, give us the big finale. <laughs> well, economic justice is, um, is, is a major theme, if not the major theme of the prophetic tradition. And um, you know, prophets are not pragmatists, they're dreamers and experimentalists. A prophet's real goal, I think, is to stretch our moral imagination and to bring the private pain felt by history's outcasts to public expression. And that's why I think if there's any group on earth that should be trying to bring people together around a common agenda of ending poverty and addressing economic injustice, it's the Jewish people. And I'd, I'd end on this um, question, is there any change except radical change? The word radical is often misunderstood for extreme, but the root definition of radical is to get at the root of something. And you can't change something without getting at the root of the reasons that change has to occur. And so I'm into the need for radical change because that's the only kind of change that matters. Well, 
Thank you, Danielle and Joe, Pia and Rabbi Simons for being on our panel and to all of you at home for joining today's discussion. So where does this leave us? Well, we end where we began. What does it mean to have power? How does money help influence and coerce? Who decides who gets to hold power and is deserving of support? And what are we prepared to do to create a more equitable and just society? I'll add one more question. What does it mean to hold power in moments of powerlessness? Putting an end to the inequities that exist in our communities and society is no small feat, but everyone can do something. Thank you so much for joining. And I'd now like to invite JDCA CEO, CEO Haley Soifer to offer some words and take us out. Haley? Great, thank you so much, Bobby. And thank you to our speakers, to Danielle, our moderator. This was a wonderful panel. I'm Haley Soifer, CEO of JDCA, and I wanna thank everyone for joining us today to discuss economic justice. While there is much to be concerned about, we are fortunate to have a president and administration that is dedicated to tackling this issue. That's why JDCA is actively supporting President Biden's Build Back Better plans, the American Jobs Plan, the American Families Plan. And to join us, please visit our website and see ways that you can take action at jewishstems.org. There you can also learn about our membership program, how to join one of our 16 state and local JDCA chapters, and our newly launched Jewish Faith Leaders Network, which is a diverse network of rabbis, cantors, and other Jewish faith leaders looking to engage outside their synagogues and pulpits with fellow democratic peers. We encourage you to share this with faith leaders in your community. And finally, please mark your calendars for next Tuesday, August 10th at 7.30 p.m. for a very special virtual program that we're sponsoring, co-sponsoring with Integrity First for America, marking four years since neo-Nazis marched in Charlottesville. We will reflect on what occurred uh, at that march and discuss what we can all do to hold neo-Nazis and extremists accountable. Thank you all again for joining us today and early Shabbat Shalom, and we look forward to seeing you all soon as we continue to advocate for and advance our values. Thank you.